MMA fighters are absolute monsters when it comes to the more brutal form of combat. But when it comes to combat that requires storylines... You can call me your new women's Smackdown champion. Smackdown women's champion? Why do we even have to say women in any way? Theatrics? Well, let me tell you, brother! I've been working my ass off over the last 17 weeks. When I put my elbow through his face, he's gonna be asking where's mama. It ain't gonna be my mama. It's gonna be his. And a ton of sports entertainment. How well did they adapt? Here are MMA to pro wrestling transitions ranked from worst to best. It's not a promo. It's not an act. I'm not going out there and doing their act anymore. Everybody, WWE Universe included. I meant that I'm going to disrespect the sport that they all love so much. Wrestling's it's scripted, it's made up, it's not real. None of those bitches can touch me. The end. Let's start with Cain Velasquez. Cain Velasquez, in my humble opinion, when I look at all of the different heavyweights that I've personally seen fight, Cain stands out as the best. The reason why Cain stands out as the best is because he has superhuman endurance. Yeah. Now those who understand even a bit of MMA know how legendary Cain Velasquez's legacy is. At one point in his career, he was regarded as the greatest heavyweight of all time, and his destruction of Brock Lesnar further proved that he was way better than the rest of his peers. But unfortunately, recurrent injuries destroyed what could have been an even better career. His last MMA fight came against Against Francis Ngannou in 2019 and he lost by a knockout in just 30 seconds into the fight. In the same year, he exited the USADA testing pool to enter the world of professional wrestling where he kicked things off with the Lucha Libre AAA Worldwide. Put in the Lucha Libre de Caín Velázquez from the UFC. Demostrando lo que tiene, ya lo decía, fue luchador, fue un American American. ¡Qué ligera de Caín! Espérate un momentito. Esto que le han dejado al Tejano Junior y va a caer a las cuerdas. Enganche para Tauro. Before making a shocking appearance in WWE in 2019, attacking Brock Lesnar after the latter's championship win. Kane signed to us long term. Yeah, Kane has a deal with us. Um, you know, I think Kane Kane is a bit more long term on a developmental. Like he wants to be a WWE superstar now. Kane piece of it will be just how good can he get, how quickly, and. And what does that mean? I think some of the personality stuff for him, different kinds of fighters, right? You have the McGregor fighter in MMA that is just loud and out there and cocky and all the other things. And then you have a fighter like Kane that was taught, don't show emotion, right. keep everything in check, fight cold. Uh, he's in that camp. So it's tough for him to turn all the emotions on sure. that he doesn't necessarily have. Uh, sort of right out of himself. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's kind of kind of pushed that out of his system. I remember when you came to my show at ESPN, you wore the mask and like I could feel your face light up. I could feel the energy. It seemed like something you loved doing, wearing the luchador mask. And when you went to WWE, it felt like they kind of used you as Cain Velasquez UFC fighter, MMA fighter. You're wearing the jeans, yeah. you're a brawler, and they weren't using you as the guy doing the Hurricane Ranas. Why weren't you El Toro in WWE? They wanted me to stay in that MMA yeah. zone. They wanted me to have that rivalry with, with Brock. Would you have preferred to be the, the luchador? Of course, that's yeah. that's who I am. I don't, know, I don't know if they saw it wouldn't work, but that to me, and I think it to everyone else, was a clear path. What do you think, though? What do you think of Kane's debut in WWE? I think uh, I think it was it was a good debut. I think it was a good debut, but I just think it could have been so much better. I think Kane, you, you could see the nervousness in his body. As soon as he took his shirt, that that was a nervous moment because he wasn't planning on doing that. I could see in his mind, right at that moment, he say, Brock got his shirt off, let me take mine off. You know, maybe he should have kept it on. I don't know, you know what I mean? He didn't look as jacked. But I think it was just that that nervous energy, man. You know, when fighters go out, he got out there and uh, got under those bright lights, man. It's nothing like it. it. It's nothing like that feeling when you hear the roar of the crowd going crazy, going nuts. Dude, that's not... Oh my God, it, it is! You know, Kane, he's been in the UFC, but being in the WWE, that's something totally different. He, he, he probably was more nervous doing that than he ever was walking inside the octagon. The two faced off at Crown Jewel in 2019 when Lesnar beat Velasquez in only two odd minutes. What happened with Cain Velasquez? Cain Velasquez was working for the company for I don't a while. Know. They I, messed I, I that one up on the creative side. I is my big guess here. I mean, they, they had one sort of match, right? Him and Brock, sort of. And then they did this yeah. weird MMA thing where they tried to make the second one like MMA and it was just a 
debacle. Like was it, it? Yeah, it was really like one of the saddest things I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of your fans were upset with the way the Brock Lesnar match went because it was so short and one-sided. How did you feel about it in retrospect? It is what it is, man. <laughs> Again, that was that was me just going into it um, and really just trying to figure out what it was. It was all thrown at, thrown at me at once. Velasquez never competed in the WWE again and was released a few months later. Ultimately, what happened with WWE? Why are you no longer with World Wrestling Entertainment? You know, why, why did they part ways with you last year? Primarily, it was because of COVID. Um, they had to just drop a lot of the roster in order just to kind of keep uh, their core guys in. And I just wasn't developed enough. Do you regret going there? I'm glad I got the experience of knowing what it's all about. And after a few more stints in AAA, his professional wrestling dream ended as well, especially after he was arrested for badly wounding a man accused of sexually assaulting his child. He found out that his son had been molested by a, a daycare worker and he went after that guy and drove, drove his car in a rage and shot a gun at him. They arrested him, they kept him in jail for a long time and uh, they finally let him out on bond. And just thank you to everybody who had my support. I love all of you. Yeah, man, just always continue to be better as a person, always do good things. And yeah, just make something positive with this terrible situation, you know? Uh, yeah. My family and I, will, we're gonna do that. Now, Tito Ortiz's time in professional wrestling was just as bad as Velasquez's. There are things that we could hand to Tito. Now, Tito's not a thinker. Don't ask him to do any thinking. If you ask him live, hey, Tito, what's two times two? There's a chance that he responds potato. How close were you in your 20s to getting into pro wrestling? So I went to, what was it, WrestleMania 34, I think it was. They came to Anaheim, and I was the champion at the time. So it was 2000, and uh, they had the ladder match that day. I thought they were just interviewing me as a normal interview like this, kind of sit down and talk, but yeah. what they're looking to see what type of personality I had, what type of character I had, and I didn't know that. And I wish I would've known that because I would've sold myself way better. I think I was too mellow-mannered. They wanted to see the crazy Huntington Beach bad boy. Oh, wow. That's what they wanted to see, and I didn't, no one told me anything. And I went in and kind of just was being very polite and, you know, respectful and, um, Never heard anything back. The former UFC light heavyweight champion had a brief stint in professional wrestling with total non-stop action in 2005, and he later made a return in 2013. You were part of TNA for a little while. Yeah, I did a little TNA. It was fun. Um, it was it was more of being an enforcer. Um, it was fun, but I thought I could do some matches. I, I I just think I think I have what it takes, and it would take a lot of hard work. I get it, but uh, I think it'd be fun. It'd just be a dream for you. In 2005, he served as a special guest referee in several high-profile matches, including the NWA World Heavyweight Championship title match. He returned to TNA in 2013, initially creating a suspense with cryptic messages. You know, I gotta ask you. You sent warning videos here pending arrival. What are you doing here? at Impact Wrestling. Well, let me tell you, JB, I knew you had a lot of questions. I know the million of fans that are watching and here tonight have lots of questions. I don't have too many answers. Before aligning himself with various factions, including Aces and Eights, which he did by backstabbing Quinton Rampage Jackson during a segment in TNA. Everybody know that we're going to fight an MMA fight in Bellator on November 2nd on pay-per-view. I am the longest reigning light heavyweight champion in MMA history, and I've kicked many of butts across this world and across the United States. So what you want me to do is to join your tag team match. The two fighters were gonna settle their score in Bellator, though Ortiz later pulled out due to injury. This was it 2019, uh, Shane McMahon reached out to me and says, what do you think about coming in and uh, just try it out? And I went and did it, and once again, I didn't think about this, and this is just about sitting here right now, I started thinking about it, I was like, that's why they didn't do it, because I wasn't over the top. They want someone over the top and just be, not crazy, but just like, be an eye catcher. Well, let me tell you, brother, I've been working my ass off over the last 17 weeks. When I get in that cage and I face Alberto Del Rio, I'm gonna smash him because I've been saying my prayers. I've been taking my vitamins. I've been doing my road work. I'm talking to the schmo, the Huntington Beach bad boy right here. I'm gonna kick ass, take names with no prisoners. I expected you to get that big four. I'd write him to his, show him who's boss, because he's calling you out, man. Let me tell you, he calls me out. He calls me a son of a bitch. When I put my elbow through his face, he's gonna be asking where's mama. And ain't gonna be my mama. It's gonna be his. And you're on a winning streak. Beat Chuck Liddell, the ice man. Not beat Chuck Liddell. I smashed Chuck Liddell. He was face down, ass up, and it wasn't my girlfriend. That's a pretty sight. It wasn't for his girl. 
Well said, Mr. Ortiz. Now, like Ortiz, Rampage Jackson also possessed immense charisma and personality. For wrestling, that's tough. I don't think I have what they have because they got to wrestle every day. They got a lot. That's a lot. I don't think I, I don't think I would like to do it. I didn't know what all the work that goes into until I was at TNA for a little bit. And I saw what they was doing and, and how often they had to do it. I was like, man, I'm glad I went in MMA. And he was often seen in wrestling rings, whether as a guest host on Monday Night Raw or collaborating with TNA. The former UFC champ had numerous opportunities to make it big in the wrestling world. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome MMA champion, movie star, and the newest member of the Impact Wrestling roster, Quentin Rampage Jackson! Yet, his career never gained momentum due to inconsistent dedication, resulting in its failure. Jackson most notably competed in TNA, where he joined the new main event Mafia stable, which also included Kurt Angle, Sting, Magnus, and Samoa Joe. Fifth member of the main event Mafia is Rampage Jackson! No! Oh my god! Jackson made his wrestling debut on Impact Wrestling's August 22 episode in a tag team match. He teamed up with Magnus, Samoa Joe, Dink, and AJ Styles against Aces and Eights, with Jackson's team winning the fight. The phenomenal AJ Styles! He's back! And he's not only back! This was the last instance of Rampage in the ring. Action in the ring, but Rampage Jackson playing in the right hand. Devon down. No. Close line for Anderson. No! Rampage! Oh, no. That wrist no. Maybe it's time for you to get back into pro wrestling. I don't know, man. I'm too old now. My, my body's all beat up. It was big news when you signed with TNA. It was big news, and I was so disappointed they didn't use me like I thought they was going to use me. Like, your debut is you nose-to-nose -nose with Kurt Angle? Like, incredible. Dude, that broke the internet for me. Then what happened from there? I don't want to talk bad about TNA, but if I'm going to keep it 100 like I always try to do, I just think they stupid. It was supposed to train me. They sent the ring to my gym, but they never sent anybody over to train me, and they never, like, you know, put the time in to train me. I was serious about it. Who knows? I probably would have left MMA and been, been like Ronda Rousey or somebody by now. But it's crazy to think that you were signed to TNA and you didn't even end up having a match there. Not even one match. And most of the time, when MMA athletes switch to wrestling, they're portrayed as serious and dominant figures. That was the intention when WCW recruited Tank Abbott after his MMA career ended, but things didn't turn out that way. What are you doing coming? Are you thinking UFC you beat up a couple guys? You're gonna come here, talk trash? Hey, you want to go? Let's go. go. Abbott initially entered WCW as someone who was going to give the undefeated Goldberg a real scare, but their rivalry never truly developed, and instead, the MMA veteran was often featured in comedic roles, making him a rather forgettable member of the roster. The final nail in Tank Abbott's wrestling coffin was the Super Bowl pay-per-view in 2000, when Tank faced off against Big Al in a leather jacket on a pole match. In the middle of the bout, Abbott brandished a knife, threatening Big Al by holding it to his throat and exclaiming, I could kill you. The cameras quickly cut away as commentator Mark Madden exclaimed, I think he's trying to skin him. What's Tank Abbott gonna do? He's gonna skin him, I think. Does he have a knife to his throat? Despite winning the match, this incident marked the virtual end of Abbott's push in the wrestling world. Next on our list is Daniel Pewter, whose wrestling career in WWE was marked by controversy and short-lived moments. Vince wanted me to do this shoot thing with the Tough Enough group and Daniel Pewter was one of them. And the one thing Vince told me though beforehand, he said, I know your neck's messed up, I know you, you can't feel your arms, just don't pick Daniel Pewter. <laughs> Yeah, Daniel Pewter, a cage fighter from an Ultimate Fighting Championship. Get a key lock on Angle before the And this one is over. Daniel Pewter eliminated by the Olympic gold medalist. Oh, Daniel Pewter, he had me good. Uh, the stupid <laughs> uh, And uh, we had like a shoot wrestling match. And the thing is, it was, it was supposed to be by pinfall. So there wasn't supposed to be submission. It was supposed to just be take the person down, pin them, one, two, three, and you win. He would have, if, if, if it would have lasted five more seconds, he would have broke my arm. However, Pewter's tenure in WWE was mad by embarrassing performances, including a lackluster pay-per-view bout against The Miz at Armageddon. His bragging about victories backstage later led to resentment from fellow wrestlers, and he was humiliated in the 2005 Royal Rumble match. You know, it's ironic that you're now doing anti-bullying when the number two thing that a lot of people will find about you is your moment in the Royal Rumble when you got hazed. I think you could you could call this bullying. You know, it was Hardcore Holly and Eddie Ben or Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit. I didn't know that was coming like that. You know, again, it, you know, companies not taking care of people. 
you know, there were rumors of his attitude and, uh, you know, he was pissing off some of the boys. Uh, you know, he told somebody he was in the main event at Royal Rumble. And, uh, you know, they were like, what are you talking about? You're in the main event. And he said, well, I'm in the Rumble. And they said, that's not the main event. <laughs> and uh, so he just came across as arrogant. And I think a lot of guys took their frustrations out on him at the Rumble. Uh, if you watch the match, uh, and during the Royal Rumble, uh, they were chopping the crap out of him. You know, the poor kid didn't even know how to wrestle yet. I, I totally get why, you know, he was upset. Oh, oh, I'll tell you what, there's a tall dude. It's like, oh, man. Oh, and there's every man for himself. Oh, look at Peter's chest. Yeah, it looks like uh, he's laying out in the sun here. And they treated me like crap and uh, very disrespectful. Pewter's stint in WWE developmental territory OVW was brief, and his derogatory comments about the promotion further tarnished his reputation. I put your finger on what it was that didn't have you last your whole four years of that contract. What exactly was it? The biggest part was after about nine months into the contract, they offered me a contract that was crap. And I called my coaches, I called a couple of my mentors, I said, this is what, this is what just happened. What do you think? And they go, well, if they don't respect you in the beginning, they're not going to respect you long term. If a company doesn't take care of me now, they're not going to take care of me in the future. Wasn't it supposed to be a million dollars broken up over four years, quarter of a mil every single year? What yeah. happened to that? So it was it was guaranteed one year and they let me go uh, after the first year uh, because they offered me another deal. But what's interesting is they offered me another deal. And because I didn't take it, then they let me go. But this son of a bitch said, I want more money. He didn't even do anything in WWE yet. And here he is demanding more money. So they said, okay, we're gonna turn you down. I think Daniel Pewter would have had a pretty decent career if he would have been cool about everything. I have to understand it was a million dollar contract over four years, which is still $250,000 a year. But here's the problem. A million dollars worth of expectations from you. Now you're starting with literally zero knowledge and zero experience and you're supposed to be able to produce at a million dollar level what do you think that's what do you think your chances of success are uh, after that um, he thought that i was the reason why he didn't work out in the wwe that's not true he just sucked as a wrestler <laughs> bob holly eddie guerrero and chris benoit they decide they're gonna f with him during the royal rumble i don't know if you remember what happened they chopped the out of him for about 10 minutes it was the most brutal uh form of um graphics i've ever seen in my life now let's talk about the good ones starting with Shayna baszler a top tier women's mma fighter over the last decade who initially trained in muay thai and brazilian jiu-jitsu but later incorporated catch wrestling into a skill set under the mentorship of ufc legend josh barnett baszler competed in various promotions like strike force and invicta fc before joining the ufc through the ultimate fighter reality show selected as the first pick on ronda rousey's team she along with marina shafir and jessamine duke formed the famous four horse women of MMA. Brina Schaefer and Jessamine Duke, who alongside Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler make up MMA's four horsewomen, have officially joined the WWE Performance Center. Baszler, a passionate wrestling fan, transitioned to professional wrestling after a UFC release, gaining experience on the independent circuit for over two years. The four of us, Marina, Jessamine, me, Ronda, were all living in the house. I'm the one that got them all into wrestling because I was a big wrestling fan. And so every Monday, and I, th I think it was like a Thursday that SmackDown was on, but I had the TV. That was my time. I arranged my training so that I could be home to watch wrestling and I would just have it on. And by proxy, these guys all got sucked into the stories and whatever just because it happened to be on and they got caught up in it. But I've heard interviews and read interviews that Rhonda has said that she saw me start pro wrestling even before NXT and saw how happy I was. And she knew she didn't have that in MMA anymore. Um, so she kind of like, it, it intrigued her to try it. So, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to take credit and say I'm the reason Ronda started wrestling. It's nothing like that, but, but I'm the reason Ronda started wrestling. <laughs> uh, because you, you have that MMA background, you're friends with Ronda. A lot of people, a lot of casual fans thought you just waltzed in from MMA world, but you went through the whole thing, stardom, Joshi wrestling, shimmer. Yeah, man, yeah. I wrestled at a fairground in front of 30 people. I showed up early on indie shows to put the ring up. I went to pro wrestling training, did shimmer. I've, I've done it all. Her proficiency led her to WWE, where she participated in the May Young Classic and subsequently signed full time. When you first debuted on Raw, you had that bloody segment to where you bit off the neck. <laughs> So the idea was 
idea was to just like shock the world, right? My debut, I do that. I'm trending on all the socials. Can't argue with it worked. Baszler first went on to capture the NXT Women's Championship before entering the WWE roster and winning the tag team titles three times. She was also named the female competitor of the year in 2019. Right. Pro wrestling is the strongest martial art. If you take the legit wrestlers and look at them, they could hang with anyone. Next on the list is Dan Seven, an ultra legend of the fight game. who was one of the first MMA fighters to transition to professional wrestling in the 90s. Unlike others, Seven juggled both pro wrestling and MMA, maintaining his status as the NWA World Champion while competing in WWE's Invasion storyline. Unfortunately, Seven's potential wasn't fully utilized. Despite his success in professional wrestling, Seven's WWE stint from 1997 to 1999 didn't see him reach the heights he deserved, and that was due to puzzling booking decisions. We had this opportunity to... to have this sh hybrid wrestling match but they bring him in and it just i i had the dungeon match with with owen and i was okay with that because owen was great understand is like they built this cage they had me go against everybody but him instead of capitalizing on his history with ken shamrock seven found himself in secondary feuds with lesser names and even when briefly involved in shamrock's rivalry with owen hart seven wasn't given the chance to shine our david came out watched me in my professional match and then he conducted his personal interview afterwards and the very first thing he ever said to me was you do realize what we do is real don't you i don't know what he was trying to insinuate about professional wrestling because i always tell people when they see those four belts i'll say they all recognize the UFC. Then they'll see the NWA belt and they'll say, well, what is that? A professional wrestling belt? And they're like, professional wrestling? And I go, well, kind of like what you would see on television, WWE, TNA. Then they'll say, you mean the fake stuff? I can say, well, no professional wrestler ever last year wore fake because to be picked up and to be bodily slammed, to be hit with chairs, I said, that takes impact, that takes force, and, and there's trauma to the body. Professional wrestlers are some of the most incredible athletes doing some of the most incredible athletic maneuvers without the aid of a safety net. What you you might be surprised to hear is I've been hurt far worse for that one single belt world of professional wrestling than I have been in all three of these belts combined. If he was utilized well, he would have been a lot higher on the list, maybe higher than Ken Shamrock. The two greatest UFC fighters of all time are looking nose to nose at what's going on here. Now, while Seven was one of the first MMA guys to make his name in professional wrestling, Shamrock was the only one who truly paved the way for MMA stars to transition to professional wrestling. If you remember, he started in pro wrestling. Yep. And then went over when you were there, mm -hmm. right, in the early days of the UFC. He was one of the first guys to figure out conditioning. His yes. gym, the Lion's Den, Lion's was Den. notorious for being absolutely brutal with their strength and conditioning routines. His reputation from the UFC as a feared competitor ensured he was booked favorably upon entering WWE. There's a journey behind that about how I traveled to get there. It's not a pretty one. But that journey leads up to me being world champion and then me being here on stage. While Shamrock's in-ring abilities were commendable, it was his entertainment value that truly propelled his success. And here comes oh. Tim Shamrock. He is all business, no doubt about that. He excelled both on the microphone and in storytelling, contributing significantly to his achievements in the wrestling world, which are numerous. For instance, he notably won the WWF Intercontinental Championship, WWF Tag Team Championship, and the 1998 WWF King of the Ring Tournament. He also became TNA's first ever world champion after he won the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. Shamrock's contributions to both MMA and professional wrestling have solidified his legacy as a legendary figure in combat sports. The question is, would he be as successful if he was a professional wrestler in today's day and age? Do you feel like you hurt yourself more doing pro wrestling or MMA? Oh, no doubt. Pro wrestling is where I get more damage. I got more damage. MMA is an area where I was good. So when I went into a fight, I could finish a guy in a minute and on to the next. Even when I had tough fights, I was good enough not to take damage because I'd take them down, work the submission game. Less damage. When I went into a pro wrestling ring, I had to give them my body. It wasn't like I could defend myself and stop them from slamming me. They're going to slam me because that's part of the pro so you were constantly three to four times every single week getting slammed, getting hit with chairs, put through tables, taking bumps for three years. Competition today is way tougher than it was back in the day, with thousands of talented wrestlers hoping to make it big. One such guy was former UFC prospect Matt Riddle, who made a massive mark in the sport despite all odds. Riddle started his career in the UFC under Dana White's leadership, where he achieved notable success. However, his journey hit a roadblock when he tested 
tested positive for marijuana twice. The first instance occurred after UFC 149, leading to the overturning of his victory against Chris Clements. Then, in February 2013, he failed another drug test after defeating Che Mills, resulting in his release from the company due to violating the wellness policy for the second time in less than a year. Now, the reason he's not in the UFC anymore is because he could not pass a drug test. And think about this, you have to go to work three times a year and you couldn't pass a drug test? You're so weak-minded and so addicted to marijuana that you couldn't stay off it enough to pass a drug test three times a year. Well, guess what, dummy? They drug test in the real world too. And I wanna know where this rocket scientist is gonna go and make a hundred something thousand dollars a year. And also, this is the guy, Matt Riddle, who did an interview and said, I smoke marijuana so I don't beat my wife and children. Oh my. Oh my. I got interviewed on a radio show and my kids are banging on my door and you know, and my wife was supposed to be watching them and then people are like, what's that noise? And I go, oh, my kids are banging on the door. I go, this is why I smoke pot so I don't beat my wife and kids. Huh. Completely sarcastic, the whole podcast laughed about it. Next day, New York Times writes, UFC fighter smokes weed so he doesn't beat wife and kid. Hmm. Oh my god. Following his departure from the UFC, Riddle briefly competed in smaller MMA organizations like Bellator before transitioning to professional wrestling in 2014. Excelling in his new venture, he quickly became a sought after talent on the indie circuit in both the US and UK from 2015 to 2017. Eventually, he signed a developmental deal with WWE in 2018. I have a theory that Matt Riddle, the pro wrestler, was born in Calgary at UFC 149. Mm. I feel like that press conference, that's when the entertainer came out in you. I think that's definitely where, like, I had some confidence going into that one. Oh, yeah. But too much confidence, and then I got fired a couple of fights later. Yeah, yeah. I heard Riddle hates English people. I, 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 I will be completely yes. honest. When I uh, fought in Manchester, England, uh, they were very cruel to me. <laughs> one fan actually spit directly in my face, and he was lucky enough where it hit my mouth. And I had to wow, go... I was kidding. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and to be completely honest, you know, I don't have anything against English people. If uh, something happens, I'll go over to London, whatever, and I'll, I'll put them down, you know. The bottom line is everybody up here on this table is a world-class athlete, and we should be treated as a world-class athlete. And for some butter tooth Brit to spit in my mouth, that was, that was, some, that was some bull. And honestly, I was, I, I've, it's never been the same. Wow. <laughs> we are definitely making the Dan Hardy fight. <laughs> He is a one-time WWE United States Champion and a two-time WWE Raw Tag Team Champion with Randy Orton. In NXT, Riddle held the NXT Tag Team Championships once, partnering with Pete Dunne. Together with Dunne, he also won the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic in 2020. Ultimately, Riddle's journey in WWE came to an end in September 2023 when he announced his departure from the company. Riddle has been suspended by... WWE because of a wellness violation, which means that Riddle took some type of a legal substance, a drug or whatever. This was not the first time. You, you mentioned rehab. It happened in late 2022 going to 2023. And I think people thought you'd be gone for 30 days but then it came out that it was your second offense, right? And so your, yeah. your your suspension was longer, correct? The original offense, was it not public? No, they it? didn't make any of the offenses public. I think they just wanted to keep it on the hush-hush, which I completely understand, yeah, sure. you know? Then, Can I ask what it was for? Uh, well, I feel, well, you're allowed to smoke weed. I did it. I went to the strip club and did some cocaine uh, a couple times, okay. and I, I failed a drug test for that. That was the first one? That was the first one. That, that, well, that was for all of them. It was cocaine oh. each time. Went out and partied a little bit, and they gave me a random test at my house, and I failed that. And shortly after that, they uh, had me go to rehab. Oh. Reflecting on his WWE release, Riddle shared that he had a sense it was coming, especially when there were no plans for him at WrestleMania 39. And after, you know, I went to rehab and stuff like that, and I got out, I didn't even think they were going to bring me back. It was mania season. I wasn't on mania, and a lot of times they do the budget cuts right after there. So I was like, think it's already chopping block time and that didn't happen. Then plus my shenanigans, you know, just acting a fool half the time didn't help things. And uh, yeah. Riddle currently competes in New Japan Pro Wrestling, where he most recently holds the NJPW World Television Championship. This is, I do believe, the uh, New Japan 
TV title that you Look just won, that. right? Look at that. Right nice. there. Is that the one? Yes. Yeah, dude. And what's that one? This is the Combat One World Championship. Wow. Won that the other day as well. So I've just been stacking titles. You know, I figured I'd just bring the collection. Didn't bring all the other titles I've won in the past. You know, that'd be too much, too much uh, carry on. But this one I could squeeze on my back. And number one on our list is Ronda Rousey. Ronda Rousey walk around like she owns a place. These people call you the baddest woman on the planet. You know what I call you, Ronda? Ronda Rousey, I call you the single biggest bitch I've ever met. When does the WWE come in? But I just love the stuff that I get to do while doing it, you know? Mm. A judo practitioner since childhood who competed in the Olympics in 2004 and 2008 and earned a bronze medal in judo in Beijing before transitioning to MMA in 2010 and making history as the first woman to sign with the UFC in 2012. Rousey rose to heights of fame with a dominant two and a half year undefeated streak marked by quick victories via armbar submissions and knockouts. She became UFC's inaugural women's bantamweight champion, holding the title for an extended period before leaving the sport following consecutive losses to Holly Holm and Amanda Nunes. Already acquainted with WWE through her friendship with Rowdy Roddy Piper, Rousey ventured into professional wrestling. At first I was like, okay, I want to have a baby soon and it'd be kind of cool to go and do some pro wrestling for a couple months before I go and have my baby. And then it just kind of like snowballed into this whole beast and this whole like other life that I didn't know that I was going to have. But it was very much like a calling, much more than a pursuit. Making a debut at WrestleMania 34. Where did you get this jacket? Uh, this is Roddy Roddy Piper's jacket that uh, his son Colton bought um, for me to wear tonight. And I promised him that every single day that I'm out here, the whole world's going to be reminded of his father and his achievements and what he's done for all of us, me included. Initially, there was a lot of skepticism about Rousey's WWE venture. Hey, you can call me your new women's SmackDown champion. SmackDown Women's Champion? Why do we even have to say women in any way? Within a few months, she proved her prowess by winning a number of titles, including the WWE SmackDown Women's Championship twice, Raw Women's Championships one time, the Tag Team Championships one time, and the women's royal rumble in 2022 i'm tired of just being here to entertain people you know i'm not taking any more direction or notes or orders and every time i go out there i'm gonna do whatever the hell i want to do it's a good look i know she was at like dinner with triple h and um and, and our agent uh, slater so i hope she does that man because People can say whatever they want, but Ronda Rousey was, she was that girl at one point. You she know was. I mean? And she put us all on the map. And Rousey left WWE in 2023 and now competes in the independent circuit. Becky pissed me off the most recently. And you know what? I don't even call her Becky. Rebecca Quinn talked shit about my husband and I told her I'd beat the fuck out of her next time I saw her. And guess what? I beat the fuck out of her, didn't I? They booed me out of the stadium. And it was just such a slap in the face. I'm just like, you know what, f you people, f all you guys. It's not a f***ing promo, it's not an act. I'm not going out there and doing their f***ing act anymore. They can say it's part of the act to kind of try to save face to everybody else, but it's not an act. I'm going out there, I'm doing whatever the hell I want, and they can explain it away however they want, but f*** them. Everybody, WWE Universe included. I meant that I'm going to disrespect the sport that they all love so much. Oh, don't break kayfabe, Ronda. Wrestling's it's scripted. It's made up. It's not real. None of those bitches can f***ing touch me. The end. Like, a lot of times people can't rehearse. Things are changed last minute. A lot of times you see them outside. They're performing. They've only talked about it. They're doing it for the first time. So a lot of these injuries happen because people just weren't able to rehearse. And the company doesn't give a shit because we're all expendable to them. Did you feel expendable to the WWE? Yes. I think we all, we all did. They made sure to make us feel that way. And yeah, just do whatever you're told. Just take it. So these were the MMA fighters turned professional wrestlers ranked from worst to best. Do you agree with the rankings? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. If you liked the video, please subscribe to our channel and turn on those notifications. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.